the beauty of birdsong. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to mention comes from one particular book called Birdsong, The Biology of Vocal Communication by W.H. Thorpe. Uh, he was a professor at Cambridge University and that book is Cambridge University uh, Press. Now, if you were to show this music to a musicologist, well, if you showed them the top line and you said, who do you think composed that? They would say, well, that, that could be someone like J.S. Bach because he composed very melodic music. And indeed it was, it was by J.S. Bach, that top uh, piece of, of music. If you were to say to a musicologist, who do you think composed the bottom uh, piece of music? Uh, and they would say, well, that could also be J.S. Bach because it also has that similar kind of musicality. If you told them, well, actually the bottom piece of music is sung by a blackbird, uh, they would probably be quite surprised because a blackbird does not have a degree in music, uh, has never been taught music, but it, remarkably uh, many songbirds like blackbirds, robins and nightingales do sing with an astonishing degree of musicality. I'll just put down a list here of the musical features in both of those pieces of music. Both of them have rhythm, there's a time signature, a melody, there's a key signature. They both have two phrases marked one and two, uh, and the phrases are kind of complement each other. Both of the pieces of music start on the key note, which is C. Uh, the first phrase in both cases ends with anticipation by a small uh, interval. Uh, that's one way you connect two phrases in, in music. Both of the phrases end with what's called binality. So the music by J.S. Bach ends with a major third, an E and a C. The music by the blackbird, will it end with an inverted major third? And uh, because in music, uh, you, there are particular intervals that will kind of finish a piece of music and birds will even use those intervals in the same way as human composers. And both pieces of music have significant top notes because they come from the arpeggio of the key signature. So it turns out that songbirds don't sing random songs. Sometimes when you hear a songbird, you might think that sounds like a random song. It's not a random song. They have particular songs in their head and they repeat them with great accuracy. If you listen to your local uh, blackbird or robin, and um, with this confinement, it's a good time to listen to your local songbirds. Listen carefully from one day to another, and gradually you'll hear that they have particular songs in their repertoire, and the same songs will come out and will be sung exactly as they were uh, before. So it's, there's amazing musicality in the songs of songbirds. Just to mention a few other uh, features. Well, I've mentioned memorized uh, songs. Some birds will sing with perfect pitch. So if they're singing a song in D major on a Monday, then as they go through the week, it will also be in D major because they have perfect uh, pitch. Very few human singers have perfect pitch, but uh, some birds have that. Some birds will even inherit a song from their parents. Uh, tests have been done where the offspring of, of some birds have been separated from their parents, they've never heard their parents, seen their parents, and yet they will produce exactly the same songs as their parents, showing that that music is written in the DNA. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? Some birds will transpose from a minor key to a major key, back to a minor key, not that many musicians can do that. Birds can sing uh, very fast. And some birds have many songs in their repertoire. The, uh, the record is actually the nightingale that can have up to 300 songs in its repertoire. That is another example of added beauty. Uh, that birds don't need to sing beautiful songs and a nightingale does not need to have 300 songs in its repertoire, but it's pleased God in his goodness uh, to make songbirds to sing beautiful songs. God has also got those birds to fly to our gardens to bring the beauty right to, to us. That's God's 
goodness. And it's a wonderful example of added beauty and God's design. Just to show you a couple of other interesting features, especially to any musicians uh, listening, one study was carried out to compare the musicality of J.S. Bach with some songbirds. And what they did was they looked through a big section of the music of J.S. Bach and they did a survey to find out, well, how many intervals did he have that were pleasant sounding like consonant intervals and how many were not so pleasant sounding, that's the dissonant intervals, uh, like a minor seventh, I think. Um, and they then compared that with the music of an African shrike. So they studied the bird song, the, the songs of the African shrike. They did another survey, how many consonant intervals, pleasant sounding intervals, like the major fifth, major third, how many dissonant intervals. And astonishingly, they found more purity in the music of the African shrike than even J.S. Bach. They were not expecting uh, to find that. But the key point here is that if birds just sang random notes, then you would have an equal number of all of those different intervals. But you can quite clearly see that there is this uh, preference for melodically sounding uh, intervals. Just a couple of other really interesting examples of bird song. Uh, it's been found that some birds, including the African shrike, will sing a precision duet. So you can see bird X and bird Y. You can see bird X is singing the upper notes and bird Y is singing the lower notes. Uh, it's normally a mating pair that uh, do this. Now to sing a duet, both birds need to know what the music is and they need to know what the key signature is, the timing is. Uh, human singers will tell you that uh, it, it takes a lot of care and attention to sing a duet and yet birds can do that. More astonishingly, uh, the African shrike will sometimes sing in a quartet. Two mating birds, X, Y, U, V, will uh, actually sing a quartet and that is really just astounding because all four birds must know what the music is and the timing and the key signature they have to really uh, cooperate so it's a, a remarkable evidence of design and beauty but i want to give you a couple of quotes from that professor at cambridge university professor wh thorpe he said he believed in evolution however he made some really remarkable admissions in his writings where he clearly seemed to have doubts about evolution in the case of his field, uh, birdsong. And he said this, it is hard to imagine any selective reason for the extreme purity of some bird notes. And then he said, we do find a great deal of elaboration which goes beyond anything which would seem to be biologically advantageous. Now, these are amazing admissions by a leading evolutionist. The reason he's making these admissions is this, according to evolution, you can never produce any kind of feature unless there is a selective advantage. Evolution never produces over-design. Everything has to have some functional advantage. And yet Professor Thorpe is saying he cannot see what is the selective reason what is the advantage of this great beauty and he said other similar statements in his uh, writings 